Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vineyardchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. Now here's this week's message. Listen, that's what we're talking about. We are talking about listening, being good listeners. In this series, last two weeks ago, we talked about how God listens to us. He desires a relationship with us. And so he's a good listener. And then last week, we talked about the value of listening to people that we care about, people we love. We, sometimes we can kind of put them on a back shelf and just let them kind of fall into a monotonous droning on and we, no no let's tune into them we care about them they're important to us and today we're talking about listening to our critics that's not easy to do right our critics tend, we don't usually want to hear from our critics we get enough criticism right I mean if I were to turn to you and say turn, turn to the person next to you and criticize them that wouldn't feel too good would it right I get it I get that all week long why would I want to come to church and get more criticism we get plenty of criticism, but we can learn from that. Reminds me of the old preacher. He was dying. I was on his deathbed. He wanted two people next to him. So two people in his church. One was a, a lawyer he didn't care for. And then this uh, tax guy worked for the IRS. So he called them in and said, hey, would you be with me at my dying hour? So they, they obliged. They came. They're sitting next. He, as they came into the door, he kind of motioned to them to sit on either side of him. And they're sitting there and they're kind of perplexed because he never really showed that he really cared for them very much. And so after a while, one of them says, you know, preacher, that's, we're honored that you asked us to be here, but we didn't know that you really cared for us. He said, well, it's like Jesus dying between the two thieves. I wanted to be like Jesus. <laughs> so criticism, right? Criticism's hard to take sometimes. We're going to talk about that. You know, we can learn from criticism. We can become better, but we have to be willing to listen. And it, most of us, when we get criticized, we get defensive. We emotionally shut down. We're not interested. We get angry. We have clever rebuttals. And then we pat ourselves on the back and say, wow, I got them back for that. Instead, I'm going to challenge that we learn to listen. Become listeners with our ears and with our hearts, and we can grow in that and profit from that. The truth is, one of the reasons why it's important to listen to our critics is sometimes we're wrong. We don't want to admit that. But sometimes we're wrong. And when we're wrong, who best to learn from than people that will point it out to us? They bring criticism. They say, hey, you know what? You, you know, you're... You messed up there. You could do better. And making peace with that, recognizing that, that uh, you know, sometimes we're wrong. That's all there is to it. Now, I want to just start out with two caveats when we talk about this. First of all, is, is that 
Uh, and it's on your outline if you want to pull that out. First of all, um, we're talking about people who criticize you, not you being a critic. It's really better if you're not part of that. You don't even be a critic. Be a positive person. Go around, shower people with praise, with encouragement. People will thrive under that. So that's what, what you want to do. But, but criticism is still all around us. So if you're going to, if you're going to, uh, approach it redemptively. In other words, I can learn from this. I can grow from, uh, from things that I don't, that don't feel good. Then you, then that's, you can still grow from that, but you don't participate in it. Galatians 5.15 says, but if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. <clears throat> so this is not a message about you being critical. It's not, I'm not giving you permission. Oh, great. I can be critical. Look at all the things people will learn. No. You can learn from it. You don't need to participate. It's like that old saying that says uh, that before you're critical of somebody, make sure and walk in their shoes for one mile first. Because then when you're critical, you'll be a mile farther away and they'll be barefoot. Right? <laughs> so you don't want to be critical. You're, but you can learn from it. Secondly, uh, not everything a critic says is true. In fact, often much of what they say is wrong. Sometimes everything they say they're wrong. Sometimes they're just a kook. So you have to be discerning. You have to recognize that not everything they say is right. Proverbs 15, 31 says, The ear that listens to life-giving reproof will dwell among the wise. So notice he says, the ear that listens. You have to listen and you have to listen to, to what's coming at you so you can de delineate. Say, oh, this is life-giving. This will make me grow. This will make me a better person. That is not. And so the only way you can learn those is by, by listening. By listening. But recognizing that you have to, as you're, like you would eat fish, a bony fish, you eat the meat, you spit out the bones, right? Okay, so we're going to look at the danger of not listening, the value of not listening. But before that, I want to just come right out of the gates with the most important, and that's this, going right for the juggler. The critic that might be speaking to you might be speaking for God. And that is, that is, should be a humbling, sobering fact that sometimes it who's the person coming or this critic that's coming your way might be God himself speaking to us either through somebody or maybe through his word. There's many different ways that God would bring that. Uh, so sometimes that's hard for, for us to really get a hold of, you know, thinking that God might not be happy. You know, some of us in our image of God, we want to always see him as he's always smiling. He always is, has rays of sunshine coming down on us. And Angel dust is sprinkling around. He's just so happy. And he does love us and he does have joy and, and, and he gives us great gifts. But sometimes when we are messing up, he loves us enough to do something about that. He knows that that's going to hurt you. That's going to hurt other people. I'm, I care about you. And so he brings correction. And when God corrects us, we want to be listening to that. Proverbs 3 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke, because the, Lord's discipli the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Now, the New Testament quotes this in Hebrews 12. It says that God disciplines those he loves. It's, a, it's part of what it means to love. Jesus talking to the church at Laodicea says the same thing. He says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So God corrects us in part, and he does it because he loves us. He cares about us. He wants us to not hurt ourselves. And so sometimes the critic may be God himself. Now the Bible, you see that there's a third of the Bible is like history, and then you have a third of it's, you know, or, or so is poetry and Proverbs. And then you have another part that is the prophets. You have three major prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, then you have 12 minor prophets. The prophets, a big part of their mission is speaking on behalf of God. Often they'll say, thus saith the Lord. They're speaking on behalf of God and they will bring correction. They're saying, you know what? You guys are messing up. You need to do something different. 
Now, do you think when they did this over several hundred years to Israel, do you think that the, the Israelites, do you think they responded well? And, oh, yeah, you know what? We, we, we are off. We need to change that. They didn't. They didn't often. They would just, they would refu- refuse to listen. Sometimes they would get angry at their prophets. Sometimes they would stone them or hurt them or, or kill them. This is their response coming back. Instead of saying, oh yeah, yeah, we need to change. Second, Second Kings 17 summarizes this really well. It says, the Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, turn from your evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen and were stiff-necked as their fathers who did not trust the Lord their God. So here you have this great uh, two-verse summary of of really several hundred years of God bringing his corrective advice. He was a critic, and they would reject it. A good example specifically was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was referred to as the weeping prophet, not because he cried, but because he had a broken heart for God's people that were resistant to him, that he knew God loved him and wanted to see the best for them and, and, and God's people would resist that and it would just break his heart. So Jeremiah, notice there in chapter six, he says, to whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Nobody seems to be listening to this prophet. Their eyes are closed so they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them and they find no pleasure in it. So Jeremiah is giving this corrective advice. They don't care. They're not interested. In fact, they take offense at it. Not only we're not going to take it, we're offended that you even say that, that God's upset or that God wants us to change. Jeremiah 32 says, they turn their backs to me and not their faces. Though I taught them again and again, they would not listen or respond to discipline. So God's saying they won't respond. They, they just turn around and go the other way. Those of you who are parents or grandparents and you remember when your kids were little, some of them were real, real sensitive to discipline. Sometimes you try to bring discipline and maybe they might get angry and stiffen up. Maybe they turn away and stomp off. Hey, don't you turn your back on me, right? <laughs> and it upsets you. Because you're trying to do something positive in their life and corrective. And they just storm off. Are you like that with God? Do you turn your back and you just kind of, I'm doing whatever I want. God's going, don't turn your back on me like that. Ask yourself those two verses we just read. If any of that describes you, here are some of the things they said. They would not listen. Does that describe you? They were stiff-necked and stubborn. Their ears were closed. The word of the Lord was offensive to them. They found no pleasure in it. They turned their backs to God and not their faces. They would not listen or respond to discipline. Now, certainly, when it comes to critics, when it comes to people that are speaking criticism and calling out change in our lives, out of all of the people, out of all the critics out there, certainly God is the one we do want to listen to. We don't, want to be, we don't want to be like the people that are being described to the prophets. Let's, let's just pray and just commit that to the Lord. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name right now. We would be tenderhearted towards you. Lord, that our ears would be open to hear what you have to say. That our pride and our arrogance would not, would not reign and, and uh, hijack what you're trying to do in our lives. Lord, we receive your loving correction. I pray, Lord, that our faces were turned towards you and we would delight in your words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we don't want to, uh, we don't want to miss that if God's speaking to us. Sometimes God speaks through people to us. Sometimes that's the critics. Now, now, Many times people are just speaking their own opinion. Just because somebody criticizes it doesn't mean it's from God. In fact, that's the bulk of it. It's just people doing, saying their own opinions. But sometimes God is speaking. We want to be, we want to make sure and we're looking for that. Number two is it could be dangerous to not listen to your critics. <clears throat> when we fail to listen to our critics, they sometimes have 
good things to say, things that will help us to become better. And we don't want to, we don't want to miss that. You know, there's a firestorm in our country right now. There's shootings going on, police shooting civilians. And there's a demand for, for videotapes, for transparency, right? Everybody here should be aware of that. There's over 18,000 police agencies throughout the United States. And really all of them can decide whatever they want to do. They, there's no governing overarching rule for being transparent. Out of the 20 largest police agencies in the United States, only two of them have a policy where videotapes of shootings, when police shoot a civilian, only two of them have a policy that says, we will release the video at some point. Now, I understand that sometimes when there's an ongoing investigation, that if people, if they release information too early, it can actually alter the way people remember events that can cause problems for an investigation. But that's not even the discussion, really, as far as the, what's being asked of the police. And now I know recently with Charlotte and, and, and some of these others, they're saying, no, we want, the, we want the videotapes immediately. But only two even have a policy at all that they'll ever release it. And why would they do that? Why would they say, well, we'll, we'll never release it even after it's all done, said and done? Well, certainly it's because the only reason is because they might make them look bad, right? But what they don't realize is that by not releasing the videos, even if, even if it does make them look bad, it looks worse when you will never release the video because it just shows a lack of transparency. I mean, I, I understand they're, they're wearing body cams. What does that help if they're not going to show it to anybody? In Virginia Beach, they are phasing that in over three years. So the first year, which is this year, one third of the police officers have body cams and then they're going to do another third and another third. And they're doing that so that we can have a more transparent law enforcement agency, which is a good thing. Most people embrace that. But the critics, which is a big part of the United States, are saying you need to release videos when police shoot civilians. And a lot of police are still saying, a lot of the people in the admin, admin, they're saying, I'm not sure we're going to respond to that. See, we, it's dangerous to not listen to your critics. We're not the first person, to, the first country to experience this. It, of course, in Israel is a great example is with Solomon. He had, a, he was a great king. King Solomon was very, very wealthy had amassed an uh, enormous amount. He had kind of capitalized on David, King David's success. Solomon was David's son. And he went on this massive building project, built a great temple for God, built even, even better palace for himself, built stables, and it, he had a, an enormous empire. And then when he died, he passed that on to Rehoboam, his son. So his son now is thinking, what am I supposed to do? And some people, some critics come up to him. They're elders in the, they were, they were uh, Solomon's peers. And they come up to Rehoboam and they say, listen, Solomon built all that really on the backs of his people. Most of us were basically in slavery. And they, we work day and night and we don't want that anymore. We're done. Things have got to change, Rehoboam. And here's where we see this in the story there, 1 Kings 12, says, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. And so they're saying, things have got to change. It's not going to go like this any longer. And so he, he hears that and he goes, well, let me have three days to think about it. And then he goes and he, uh, and he, and he talks to people and they say, he talks to, so that's his critics. He goes and talks to some other people and they say, well, you know what? They're really right about what, you know, their request. They say, if, if you today will be a servant to these people, this is advice of elder, older people, and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. So they say, listen to them. They've got something to be said. Well, he didn't really like that answer. So he goes to some younger guys, just guys his age, and says, what do you guys think I should do? This is what my critics are saying. Here's some advice I got. And the younger guys go, hey, don't do that. You come in hard. They, if they sense you're weak, they're going to take advantage of you. Walk all over you. Tell them that Solomon's waste 
is going to be like my pinky, and I'm going to just give it to you even harder. And so he thinks about it. He comes back. That's what he does. He decides to go with this advice where he says, I'm going to make it harder. He ignores the advice of the, the elders. And here's what happens there in verse 15 through 17. So the king did not listen to the people. He didn't listen to his critics, right? And that's dangerous. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? To your tents, O Israel. Look after your own house, O David. So the Israelites went home. But as for the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah, Rehoboam still ruled over them. So it split the kingdom in half. Israel was 12 tribes. Now there's only, there's only like two tribes. Two small tribes in southern Israel. The other 10 say, no thank you, we're done. And it causes this massive split, destroys this the, the, the Israel, as it was supposed to be, is, it, it separated it, never to be repaired again. Then later on, when they're attacked from the outside, they're divided from within, and it starts to crumble and disintegrate. It was all, and it all, and it roots back to this moment here. When, when critics came to the governing forces and they ignored, they ignored the criticisms. It was dangerous for them. It always is. It's always dangerous to ignore your critics. You have people that come into your life that will criticize you, that will say things, that, that calling out change, challenging you. And you're, it's, you, it's easy to look at somebody else and go, yeah, look at Rehoboam. Yeah, look at the police, you know, the, the 18,000 police agencies out there. But when it's your turn, when you get that opportunity every week, somebody's criticizing you, how do you respond? Do you respond humbly? Do you respond, hey, I want to learn? There's maybe, is there something I can learn out of this? Because you realize it's dangerous. Now, I want to point out that Rehoboam did do a couple things, right? First thing is when somebody comes to you and criticizes you, don't respond immediately. That's, don't react immediately. You want to just take it in. It's easy just to react and, and, and that's, that's, you know, the emotional side, but you want to just take it, you know, I'm going to wait. And he did do that. And when you, when you, when you react immediately, things kind of don't work well. For years, uh, when some people would come up and say something after the sermon, they would challenge me or something. And my tendency, like anybody else, would be to react and defend myself. And, and then nothing good comes from that, you know, and then they get into their corner, I get into my corner, next thing you know, we're kind of arguing, and have a good day, you know, that's how you end a Sunday, that's not a great experience, it just ends in, you know, just, you know, quarreling, pride only leads to quarrels, it says, but wisdom is found in those who take advice, what is pride? Pride is when we think we are right, I'm always right, you know, they just, I just know better, than, uh, other people just can't see it, right, don't you ever feel like that? You're right, <laughs> that's pride so we need, pride recognizes that I might be wrong I mean no, not humility I might be wrong pride is just, I'm not wrong I'm right and all it does is cause things to get amped up for us to of course not to listen not to learn and we react out of that another thing Rehoboam did well is, is um, he got advice from more than one person there's having another sounding person, another source that you can go to can be very, very helpful. And you can learn from them. It says plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. So you don't just go look for people that agree with you because we all have them, you know, and you just tell your side of the story with your slant, your bent. I've over the years, I've done a fair amount of marriage counseling. We have a, a big staff now, so there's a lot of other people that really are better than me at it anyways. But it's amazing how many times I would have somebody, one person in front of me, and they would tell me their side of the story. And, it, and uh, you know, I mean, it just sounds like the way they're describing it. That other person is like the biggest, you know, piece of trash that ever walked the earth. And then after a while, the other person would join them. Whole new story every time. Without a doubt, every time, hold, well, you didn't tell me that. Well, yeah, you know, but what, what you, you left that part out. Well, you know, 
So it's, you don't just go find people that agree with you. you. Sometimes people that don't agree with your perspective can help give you good, sound advice when you have a critic. When you have a critic. Number three, you can learn valuable advice from your critics. Again, sometimes you just realize, you know, I'm wrong. I can grow in this. I, 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 and critics can see things that we don't necessarily see. You know, some of us, we actually pay people to criticize us. I do. Once a year, I, I play handball, and once a year, I get one handball lesson from a pro. I'm kind of cheap. I'm Dutch, so that's all, that's all he gets. That's 50 bucks an hour, man. I'm not paying more than that. <laughs> but I pay him for a whole hour to abuse me. All he does is I say, okay, let me have it. He watches me swing, watches, and he goes, I don't even know where to start. You're doing so much wrong. <laughs> you know? And he fills that hour packed with criticism. And at the end of that, I have a big grin. I'm smiling. I'm paying him. Thank you for criticizing me today. <laughs> Some of you do that with music lessons. I know people that have businesses. They, they pay good money for somebody to come in and criticize their business and say, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. You need to change the infrastructure. You need to do that. You need to streamline that. I mean, they're just criticizing them and they pay them for that. See, we can learn a lot if we have the right attitude. It's interesting. If somebody criticizes us for free, we're not interested in that. Now I'll pass on that. But if I, I'm looking to pay for someone though. Does anyone want to criticize me and I'll pay you? Then I'll listen. And that's kind of an odd dynamic that goes on, right? Because if you're willing to learn from free, criti free criticism, there's plenty of that. You'll get your money's worth so t time and time again. Because there's plenty of people that have criticism for you. Some of, you know, sometimes the people that criticize us because last week we talked about, you know, listening to people we love, people we care about. Sometimes those are the biggest critics in our life. And that can be difficult. When you're living with the biggest critic in your life, it's the person you're married to or the person that you're close to. Still works, though. You can, there are still things that you can learn from, from that person. You know, you can just shut down and just say, ah, hypocrite. I'm not going to listen to anything they say. You know, that's, that's what a lot of people do. That's probably what most people do. You can be different. You can learn from people in your life. Proverbs 19.20 says, Listen to advice and accept instruction. And in the end, you will be what? You're the one who benefits. You become wise. In his book, Necessary Endings, Dr. Henry Cloud talks about the difference between the fool and the, and the wise person. And he unpacks the Bible, you know, particularly Proverbs, and says, what is the difference between somebody who's wise and somebody who's a fool? And we see in the Proverbs particularly that the wise person is not wise because of his education. He's not wise because of his position, his intelligence, his talent. It is because of his attitude. You see, he says there in his book, he says, a fool is all about how he receives or instruction or correction. He says, when we listen, when we're, uh, when we're not defensive, when we accept responsibility without blame, and we change without delay, we are wise. He says, fools resist, resist change, are defensive, and blame others. What are you when somebody criticizes you? Are you, do you blame them? Do you get into this big defensive posturing? Chances are you do if you're like me. That's why we're talking about it. That's why we're saying, let's choose to change. You're not going to be able to change other people. Have you figured that out yet? They don't, they, maybe they'll change, but they probably won't. And if they do, it'll probably have nothing to do with you. But you can change. You can say, I refuse to go through this life. And all I do is react negatively when somebody criticizes me. Here's a good example. In, in, in Exodus 18, Moses He's got a lot on his table and he's leading this, basically this mob, you know, it's the Israelites, they have been, they've been released from 400 years of slavery, they're in the wilderness and he's over the whole thing. This like 
two, three million of these Jews wandering through the wilderness and there's not really a, a, an infrastructure in place. And so there's all these problems that are cropping up as you would expect. And they all go to Moses over and over. They're going to Moses. He has to solve it early in the morning till late at night. That's all he's doing is just resolving disputes. And then he gets somebody who criticizes the way he's doing that. Now he could get all defensive. Look at how hard I'm working, he could say. Why don't you just help instead of just criticize? Right? He could say, that could be his response, but he doesn't do that. Notice what happens. There in verse 17, Moses' father-in-law replied, this is, this is his critic, right? What you're doing is not good. Has anybody ever said that to you? Yeah. What you're doing is not good. That sounds like a criticism to me. I don't know about you. Last time I heard that from somebody, it sure sounded like a criticism. What you're doing is not good. Moses doesn't get defensive though. He says, you and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. <clears throat> he does give him advice. The advice he says is, why don't you restructure things, create like a hierarchy so you have courts uh, over, you know, people that dis call, uh, resolve disputes over, you know, over big cases and then smaller cases. And, and so Moses ends up being like the Supreme Court and he's not spending all day in, 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 in small claims court. It's, it's this hierarchy put, he builds into place. And it makes things way better for Moses. He learns because he doesn't get all defensive. He doesn't get, you know, he doesn't try to, you know, Jethro, you don't know what you're talking about. This is the father-in-law. Exodus 18, 24. It's not on your outline, but it says this. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. Now, I'm a new father-in-law. I like that verse. <laughs> so if you're a father-in-law, that's a good verse. You just pass it around. You should memorize this. Exodus 18, 4. <laughs> Moses did everything his father-in-law did, said, and it worked out for him, you know. So we listen to our critics. And we need to listen. And we can learn, you know, not just from good things they say. We can learn from things that, are, that they say that are dumb. You just say, well, I'm, I won't do that. Here's the great news about this. Is when you can learn from somebody's bad advice and their good advice, you learn both ways. You're, you're, you're learning twice the rate. So you can learn from both. Instead of just discounting it and say, you know, and, and you learn, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to, I can grow in that. I want to close with this last verse. It's a great verse where Jesus is talking about uh, when somebody sins against you, somebody's hurt you, somebody's uh, offended you in some way and it's hurt you deeply. And he says, uh, when somebody is, when somebody's offended you, when somebody's hurt you like that, he says, go to them privately. One-on-one, -on -one, go to them. No, often we don't do that, right? Somebody hurts us, we go to Facebook. <laughs> Tell him the world. <laughs> You'll think twice next time you say something like that to me. Or we go tell our friends or we tell people. Jesus doesn't say that. He says, go to that person privately. This is such an important value. You know, it's, we have four top values in our church. This is one of those four. Bit learning to confront people biblically. Because we're all in that work in process and, and, and relationships are at stake if, if we do this wrong. And relationships are so important. So we made it one of our top four values. And so we go to that person and here's what Jesus says. He says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you, if he listens to you, you have won your brother over. And when we read that verse, we normally think in terms of, okay, somebody's offended me. I've got to go talk to them. I've got to get muster up the courage. I've got to do that. I want to honor God in this process and all that's true. But for just today, I want to challenge you to picture yourself in the other person's position. The person who is the one who hurt that person. Now, when somebody came and confronted him, at that moment, that person was the critic, right? Hey, man, I didn't like what you did. I didn't appreciate that. See, they're criticizing that person. 
And because that person received it, that's just as important, isn't it? Because that person didn't get all prideful, didn't get all arrogant, didn't get defensive, didn't start pulling out some zingers. Then he says, the relationship was restored. What was broken was restored. Now, listen, everybody here can fall prey to this stuff. And most of you here can probably think of somebody that you have a relationship that has suffered because of this dynamic. There was some criticism. Maybe you were the critic and it didn't go well. Maybe you got criticism and you responded differently than you could have. So I'm not here to try to make you feel bad. I certainly have done plenty of that. But let's make a decision together. Let's say, God, with your help, we're going to follow your wise advice. We're gonna, we want to have good, solid relationships. And some of you who have broken, you have, there's, a, there's a fracture. Then you can do something about that. And if there's criticism that comes, you just learn. You just, and it, this message is for you, not for them. You don't say, well, you need to listen to Andy's message. No, you listen, and I listen to my own teaching, and I say, listen, I want to be somebody who can listen and learn from my critics. I'm not above that. How about you? Let's stand and we'll pray. Well, I'm going to invite our prayer teams to come up. As always, we, we look for opportunities to serve you, to pray for you, to lift you up. If you're in a place where maybe you have a tender relationship, maybe there's criticism going on. I, 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 this is no joke. I, the criticism is tough stuff. That's why most of us, we all react real similarly. We all get angry. We all get defensive. It's, it's a supernatural thing to be able to take criticism and let it go. That is not normal. This is something God does in you. And so you invite God and you invite the Holy, the, 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 the Holy Spirit and the presence of the, of the Lord to come in and, and change your makeup. It's miraculous to be able to do that. Most of us, we're, we have like, Velcro hearts, and God wants to give us Teflon hearts. You know, Velcro where we absorb everything. Oh, I can't take any more of that. Instead of letting it slide off. But God can do it in your life. He can allow criticism to come in over and over, and it slides off. And a big part of that is learning how to give it to the Lord. To say, God, you died for all the sins of the world. You also died for all the harsh criticism, all the stuff that people say that hurt people. I want to give that to you. Let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Father, and we just pray, let your sovereign act come for those. I pray for everyone here who has been hurt deeply by criticism. It's possible that there's no deeper hurt than somebody we really cared about or somebody who was important to us and they, they criticize us. And so Lord, I just pray for forgiveness, the power to forgive, the power to let go. Lord, I pray when, if at all possible, as far as it, it's available to us, as far as it's possible within our ability, Lord, we pray for restored relationships. Lord, I pray that for each of us here, we would not pick up the mantle of criticism, even if our parents were that way, even if our spouse is that way. Because that's the, that we, next thing we know, we get swept up into the stream of criticism that is raging around us. Teach us, Lord, to be positive people, to be people that lift up and affirm others. Now, Lord, I pray for, for all of us here. If you're, critic, if you're bringing criticism, if you see something in us that you would like to see changed, that you know it's going to harm us, it's going to harm others, it's not helpful, then today, Lord, we put our hands down 
We're not going to turn our face from you. We're not going to raise our fist up and say, no, I refuse to hear from you. Instead, would you pray, say, God, I have a tender heart. I have a receptive heart to your word. Sometimes I'm wrong. And it's dangerous to ignore criticism. Lord, I pray for our country that is embroiled in so much pain, so much division, racial division, injustice, all the things that are happening. God, I pray that as a country, we would not ignore our critics. People calling out for change, calling out for justice. Help us, Lord, not, not just to dismiss criticisms that are coming. Help us, Lord, to be a redemptive voice of reason in our places of influence. Lord, I pray for anyone here who maybe you're just in a real, maybe you don't feel very close to God right now. I want to invite you to come and just say, Jesus Christ, I want to I, help me to reboot my spiritual life. Help me to discover what that means to live in the kingdom presence. Would you say, I want to put my faith on the forefront again. It's not okay to neglect my soul. Would you say, God, I want to put my faith on the forefront start investing in things that really matter, like my own spiritual growth. If that's you, then just I, I, I want to pray for you. Father, I just pray that you make yourself real to each person who, made that, who said that prayer. Let them see your hand, your strong hand, move in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.